All right, hey, welcome back. This is Mr. Kelly. We're on 1.3, rates of change in linear functions and quadratic functions. So let's review a little bit what the average rate of change is. We know that that's the slope, right, of the secant line. Now, secant line might be a new word for us. So let's pretend like we're looking at a closed interval from A to B. So maybe A is like right here. It's my favorite A right there. All right, let's label that. So that would be the X value is A. What would we call the Y value? Let's call it f of a, okay? f of a. And then we'll just close that off as a coordinate point. And then over here somewhere we have a value of b, and so the point would be f of b. So the x value would be b, the y value would be f of b. All right, so the secant line, I don't know if you knew this. You know what a secant line is? I'm gonna try my best, here we go. Whew. That was not bad for Mr. Kelly. The secant line goes through the two points. And we learned in the last lesson that the slope of the line that goes through these two points, or the secant line, will give you the average rate of change. So if we're using notation of a, f of a, and b, f of b, we can write that as, uh, what do we want to do? We want to do y2 minus y1. So let's do, I'm going to get rid of that, f of b minus f of a. And then we have to do x2 minus x1, right? So it's change in the dependent variables over the change in the independent variables. That would be the formula for us. So as I said, today we're going to look at linear functions. We're going to look at quadratic functions. Linear functions, you know, are straight lines, right? We want to find the average rate of change for each linear function. So I'm going to look at number one right here. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find two points. And I love zero, zero, because that gives me some easy math. And right here's the point. 3, 2. So if I were looking at this interval, it goes from 0 to 3. So let's write that out in interval notation from 0 to 3. All right. And then what is our average rate of change? I know I have to go up 2, right? And then over 3. So the up 2 is the y, right? That would be on top. And then we go over 3. Oh, that's interesting. Let's look at, uh, suppose. You know, the person next to you said, well, I didn't use those two points. I looked at these two points right here. It's a different interval, but let's see what happens. Like maybe someone else, we'll use different color here so we can look at it. Maybe someone else used, I said different color. Someone used red maybe. And they said, all right, from the interval of three to, what do we go over to six here? Right, what do you have to do? It is still up two over three. That's the average rate of change for number one. All right, well, that's interesting. I noticed I got two over three for both of them. Maybe that's a coincidence. Let's look at number two. Number two, I'm gonna use that point there. That looks like a very nice point. And this point right here is also a very nice point. And when I say very nice, look, it goes through exactly the little crosshairs there. So I know that the values are very, uh, they're very nice numbers. They're very neat, like negative two. And then we have a seven. And we're going to go all the way to negative 1. So what is the average rate of change from negative 2 to negative 1? Well, in this case, we have to go down 2. So we're going to be very careful. Change in y is down 2. And we go over 1 still. We're always going to the right one. So that would give you with just negative 2. Let's just simplify that. Everybody likes negative 2. Now, suppose you picked a different set of points. Look at this. It's down 2 over 1 again. So from negative 1 to 0, we get the same thing, negative 2 over 1. And guess what would happen if we picked two different points? Same thing. You would get down 2 over 1. Do number 3 by yourself. It's a little bit tricky, but it's a little bit easy. You know what I mean? Pause the video and do number 3 all by yourself. So how did you do? I got a slope of zero for both of these. The average rate of change is zero, which makes sense because this line is just, it's called flat line, right? It's just going straight across and it does not change. So the rate of change is zero. The average rate of change is zero between these two points. The average rate of change for a linear function, did you notice how it changes here? It doesn't, it's constant. So we're gonna write down constant and that means that regardless of the input value, interval length, the average rate of change stays the same. And that last part, what that means is I could have used, say, in number two, the very first point and the very last point. And what do we get here? We have to go 
I'm going to do that. Let's do that just to prove my point real quick. It doesn't matter if I'm going over by one or if I'm going over by, let's start here and go all the way down to here. How far over is that? From negative two to one, that would be, uh, that's over three. But how far down do we go? One, two, three, four, five, six, and then over three. So it's down six over three. Notice that reduces to negative two. So it doesn't matter the length of the interval. Uh, the the average rate of change is going to stay the same for a linear function. Well, what does that mean for numbers 4, 5, and 6? They want you to find the rate of change of the average rate of change for each linear function. What does that mean? That means that we have to find the slope. So for number 4, it was 2 thirds. Then it found the slope again, and it was 2 thirds. And if I were to find it again, guess what it would be? Constant, 2 thirds. So what would the rate of change between these slopes be? Like how is the slope changing? And you notice the slope for a linear function does not change. It would be uh, two thirds each time. So the change in that slope would be zero. Let's look at number five. First we got negative two, right? And then for the next interval, we got negative two. And if we did another interval, we would get negative two. And we would find the difference in those average rates of change would be zero. And lastly, this last one was so easy, right? Because we got zeros involved. Uh, what do we get? We get zero, and then the next rate of change would be zero, and then the next rate of change would be zero. And then if we find the rate of change in those average rates of change, it would be zero. So that's, you know, if you're looking at the rate of change of the average rate of change, or how is the slope? changing for a linear function. The slope doesn't change. And that's why we get zeros when we're looking at those average rates of change. It's always going to be zero. Easy enough. Well, that's, you know, that's basically linear functions. Let's go to quadratic functions. So with number seven, uh, we're given a quadratic function and it's up here. We always want to know what that function is. So look, right here is our quadratic function equation. Y equals X squared minus two X. And we want to find the average rate of change. Uh, on the given interval. And so now we're using inequality notation. For number seven, we have uh, x has to be between greater than one or equal to, and then less than or equal to two. So we're really talking about looking at this point right here, and that's one, right? x equals one, and then x equals two is at this point right here. And we want to find the average rate of change, which is the slope. All right, well, the slope here would be up one, okay? So from one to two, the slope is up one, so it would be positive one, and then we go to the right one, which is positive one, that's just one. All right, let's move over to number eight, where we have the same function, but a different interval goes from two to three. So the interval from two to three, if we notice, this is a little different, right? So the interval from two to three, uh, we have to go up one, two, three, and then over one. So it's up three and then to the right one. So we get an average rate of change of three on that one. Now let's look at nine from three to four. As we move along this function, we get a point at three and a point at four. Uh, what do we have? One, two, three, four, five, five up and then one over. And if it helps you to draw that slope triangle, that's okay. But we're gonna document what we have here. From three to four, then we need to go up five and to the right, one. Okay, that's just five over one. Can we do this if we're looking at uh, interval notation and kind of figure out the pattern here? What do we think? Well, let's use the function, which is x squared minus two x. I'm going to write that down here so I can look at it. Y equals x squared minus two x. And so they've given us this interval, but we don't have a fancy graph. Look, these graphs don't go far enough. So we're just going to use that equation. Equation is y equals x squared minus 2x. So let's just find y of 4. We can write it like that. That means I'm going to plug a 4 into y. And we know the equation is x squared minus 2x. So that would equal 4 squared minus 2 times 4. And that would give me what? 16 minus 8. And that's just going to be 8. Then we can figure out y of 5. So y of 5 is, I'm just plugging a 5 in here as the input. We get 25 which is five squared minus two times five. So 25 minus 10, 25 minus 10. What is that, I've worked that all out. I think you'd probably get 15 there. Okay, so the difference between these two, if I were to find these out, this would be the point four eight. 
and the second one would give the point 515. So I can look at it and say the change in Y is seven, right? It's gonna go up seven and then over one, so we get seven. You do the last one by yourself. Go ahead and do number 11, use the equation here and find the average rate of change between those points. All right, how'd you do? What do we get, Y of five and Y of six? We already did Y of five, so we find 24 and 15, subtract, and we get an average rate of change of nine. So can I just, let's look at the average rate of change across this quadratic function as we move on equal intervals. Look, this is a distance of one, this is a distance of one, this is a distance of one. And as we look at those average rate of changes, I'm gonna write those down. The first for number seven, we got an average rate of change of one. And then for eight, we got three, and then five, and then seven, and then nine. So when you're looking, remember these are the average rate of change. And how is that average rate of change changing? Well, you have to go up two, you have to go up two again. And as we travel across these different intervals, you notice that we get the exact same rate of change of the average rate of changes. That's a little bit tricky to think about. It's a lot of words. So think about the average rate of change or the slope. How is the slope changing for this function? And the slope is increasing by the same amount, which means we have a very small slope and you move over, the slope has increased by a certain level and you move over and it's increased by the same level. This is what happens for quadratics. So we say that the average rate of change for a quadratic function does not stay the same. We can see that it changed across these intervals, right? For consecutive equal length input value intervals, which means that these distances are the same, the rate of change of the average rates of change of the quadratic function is constant. So if you look, essentially you look at the slopes and how are the slopes changing, they remain the same for a quadratic. For the above problem, the constant is two. Okay, so for number 12, they want us to find the rate of change of the average rates of change. So the first thing we need to do is find some output values, right? So they just give us a function. So let's just pick some input values. I just picked negative two, negative one, zero, and one. You could, you know, you could start at zero and go to 10 or however far you wanna go. It doesn't matter what input values you pick, but you do have to make sure that the distance between them is equal. And so if you figure out all of these input values, we're going to get a two, for negative two, for negative one, we get an eight, zero is 10, and then one is eight. All right, maybe some of you guys can do that math in your head, that would be good. But now we wanna find the rate of change of these average rates of change. So we need to find the average rate of change right here. So from two to eight, what is the average rate of change? That is going, what, up six as we go over one, so it would be six over one. I'm just gonna call that a six. And then as we go from eight to 10, uh, you go up two as you go over one. That's the benefit in just going over one, it makes easy slopes. And then as you go from zero to one, uh, you, what do you do? You go down two. So let's look at the average rate of change and how that's changing. When you go from six to two, then you are going down four. And as you go from two to negative two, you are going down four. And you guessed it, if you kept going down this quadratic function, as you go to the right on the x-axis, as x increases, the rate of change of the average rates of change would be constant at negative four. Okay, so we did number 12 together. You think you can do 13 by yourself? I think you can. Go ahead and do number 13, pause the video. You can do that one by yourself. Go, find the rate of change of the average rates of change. All right, here's what I got. I chose intervals starting at zero because I love zero math. Zero math is easy. So I plugged in from f of zero all the way to f of four to find some intervals here. And then I found the average rate of change. Now, what is the rate of change of this average rate of change from one to seven? That is up six. So I'm gonna say positive six and then positive six and then positive six. So you can see the, av the rate of change of the average rate of change is positive six. That's easy enough. So for a quadratic, the rate of change of those average rate of changes is constant. Whoo! All right, number 14 is our very last one. It's a different type. 
it's talking about uh, they give us a table of values and they tell us that the function is either concave up which we remember kind of looks like this right or concave down which looks like this but it's not both which means it doesn't squiggle around like a polynomial function it says determine if the function is concave up or concave down now what we're going to do to do this is we're going to use the uh, average rate of change here let's figure it out from 18 to 20 remember this is the y value so we'll do 20 minus 18 which is 2 over 1 and then we'll go to the next equal length interval here so we go over and we get 0 right over 1 and the next one you guessed it is negative 2 over 1 and then negative 4 over 1 so how is the average rate of change changing this is the average rate of change. We get two over one and then zero, the negative two and negative four. Notice how the average rate of change is decreasing, which means that your slope of your secant line, if I drew a secant line here, first it's two, right? And then it goes to zero. So then the line goes like this. And then it goes to negative two, which looks like this. And then it goes to negative four, which looks like this. And if we were sketching that function, it would, first have a positive slope and then it would go oh, where's my little marker here come on marker you have a positive slope and then the slope was zero and then it's a negative slope and more negative that's concave down this isn't too difficult and some students can look at this and just figure it out but if the average rate of change is decreasing then we'd say it is concave down and you guessed it if it's increasing it would be concave up here's how i can write that out the function is concave down because the rate of change is decreasing over equal length input intervals. All right, I think that's it. Good luck to you all on 1.3. This is Mr. Kelly. Remember, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. See ya.